welcome to Lifestyle Solopreneur, the community for entrepreneurs who put lifestyle first. Join your host, Flavia Barris, as she interviews successful lifestyle solopreneurs and shares ideas to help you find the perfect balance between lifestyle, business, and self. Flavia is an attorney, marketing expert, and founder of several online academies. She's been featured in major media, including BBC World News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, ESPN Television, and more. Join us for this episode of Lifestyle Solopreneur. Hey, Lifestyle Solopreneurs. Today, we get to speak with Gary Surak. He is a third generation owner of Surak Financial Services. He is also an entrepreneur and an author of the book, How to Retire and Not Die. Love that title. Gary, welcome to the show. Ah, thank you very much. It's great to have you. I love the title of your book, by the way, How to Retire and Not Die, because most people write books on how to retire and have the finances to, you know, how to retire and stay healthy, how to retire. But you cut to the chase. You're like, how to retire and not die? Because really, it's all about living for as long as possible in retirement or retiring earlier. I mean, either one makes a lot of sense. A lot of people struggle with retirement because they they get there and they've waited so long to get to that stage that they've left behind all of their hobbies. They no longer have outside interests. Their life was just work, work, work. And so they struggle in retirement. But tell us a little bit about your journey, what you do, and how you came to be this icon in the world of retirement that you are. Well, I'm a financial advisor and family-owned business, really 65 years old this year. And I've been doing this for about 40. And what I thought was everybody that would talk to me about retirement was always focused on money. That's all they ever want to talk about. They want to make sure they got enough and everything's good. And that's all cool. It makes sense. And I 100% agree. You've got to have that. But what I realized is that what they weren't focusing on is the rest of their life. So I would be sitting in these meetings, listening and thinking to myself, okay, you have plenty of dollars, but what are you going to do with your time? And so I started asking questions like, tell me about your first day, your first week, your first month of retirement. And they would look at me like a deer in headlights. Some would say, oh, we're going to go for a two-week vacation. I said, great. Tell me about the day you get back from that vacation. What are you going to do for the rest of your life? And they, they didn't have answers. And what I found, Flavia, is that they basically didn't have a plan. They didn't have purpose. They didn't have passion. And that really didn't fare well for the future. They just got unhealthy. And a lot of them passed away and got sick. And it was just a bad scenario. And that really is what drove me to write the book. And so tell us about the book. What is the focus of the book? Who would I pull this off the shelf and hand to? Well, the book is not about money. So we tell you right away, if you think this is a book about money and retirement, put it back on the shelf because we don't want your bad review. This is really a book about what to do with the rest of your life. And what I want to do, I, I have... Actually, it's fascinating. I have people in their 50s buying it. People have actually retired and can't figure it out. And people in their 30s and and the 30-year-olds are saying, well, this book makes sense because at some point we're going to retire. But if you can tell me what to do in advance, I'd like to know. So what I found is the market is different than I actually expected. But the long and short of it is what I really try and do in the book is give them ways to figure this out in a a humorous kind of low key setting, but very serious. I mean, I tell people you've got to take this like it's real because it could be the next 25, 30 years of your life. Well, people are living longer, right? Life expectancy. And that's the tough thing with retirement. It's this set end point of your working life, but nobody knows how many days, years, you know, decades they have left. And so as a financial planner, Does that uncertainty unnerve people and sort of cause them to have a lot of uncertainty about what to plan for? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, it's all unknown. I mean, let's face it, life's unknown, but really retirement is very unknown. And not only is it unknown, you're entering a phase of your life where all the routines you've had are gone and you don't have any routines. So you get up in the morning, you do your breakfast, you whatever, you go to work, you clock in, clock out, five o'clock, you roll out, maybe you, whatever you're doing, all of a sudden that system five days a week for the last 40 some years is done. 
And that is uh, very unsettling. So take that on top of the fact that how long am I going to live? What are I going to be able to do? It, there's a lot of stress that comes with retirement, which people are sort of floored by. And so a lot of people have, there's some commonality among retirees, right? Golf is a huge one. Gardening, art classes, walks on the beach. Like these are a lot of things. They're sort of the classic, what will you do with your time after retirement? Travel is a huge one. But you work with so many people that are planning for retirement and have gotten to that milestone. What are some of the most unusual sort of retirement dreams that client that you've helped clients achieve? Well, I, I've seen some wins and some massive failures, by the way. The failures, I'm not going to take uh, fault or blame for. That was their choice. I just said, huh, that's interesting. Anyway, yeah, I'll give you a great one. I, I have a guy who decided he was going to play drums. So he bought a drum set and he was retired. He put it in his basement. Unfortunately, he neglected to tell his wife and he started beating on the drums and she thought the whole house was, I mean, it almost gave her a heart attack. Anyway, it turns out that his drum teacher, after many, many months, let him know that the chances of him becoming a reasonable drummer were somewhere between nil and not that good, and that he was never going to be worth. He said, you're wasting your money and you're just not going to get this. And he said, all I can tell you is that this is not a hobby you need to pursue. So he ended up donating the drums to the high school, which made them very happy and it made his wife ecstatic. And now he paints, which, by the way, is very quiet. So he uh, and he won't be a very good painter, but he's much happier. And so that's one of those things. And his wife is extremely ecstatic about that because he turns on his rock music and leaves her alone. But I've had some good ones. I have a client of mine that decided they're going to go see the country. And he just loaded up his car with his dog and drove for the next three months and visited places around the country that he had never been to. Uh, had a great time and and would send me pictures and (laughs) all kinds of little information about what he was doing and all the weird things he was stopping to see on the road that he knew didn't, you know, he would never have known they existed. So good stuff like that. So for in your world, at what age do you see most people sort of gravitate towards financial planning, future planning, retirement planning? Because it does sort of seem like it's the kind of mindset that the young, the 22-year-olds don't really have on their radar yet. And then at some point in life that changes and shifts and they're thinking, you know, I have to start planning. I have to be responsible. I need some advice on how to handle finances. Is there sort of an average age to which people show up at your doorstep? About 40 to 45 is when they really kind of jump in and that's what happens. They start looking at this and saying, huh, I guess I need to take this seriously. And I say, oh, you definitely have to take it seriously because it's the real deal. You need to start planning this out, at least thinking in terms of hobbies and things you wish you were doing and and getting your finances in order. And if you've got big credit card debt, let's look at eliminating those dollars from your world and starting to use them in a positive way. And, And so I think 40 to 45 is when the bell rings and the light comes on a little bit. And then about 50, they really get serious. And by 55, they're they're kind of chomping at the bit. Okay, what do we do? How do we get this? So that's kind of the timeline. But what is the age at which you wish people showed up at your door? About 30. Okay. And, and the reason for that is I do something in a book called a wish list. And the wish list is something that I discovered for myself many years ago. When I was working, there'd be days I'd look out the window, it was beautiful. And I say, man, I wish I was playing golf or I wish I was going on the boat or I wish I was doing something. And it was never sitting at my desk working. So I started writing all those things down. And by the time I noted, I had probably 50 different things that I had written down that I wished I had been doing, except I was working and couldn't do them. And so I love the fact that as I got into partial retirement, and I'm semi-retired now, I have that huge wish list of things that I can knock off. And some of it's travel, some of it's going to see an art museum, some whatever it is. It's just kind of fun, cool stuff to do that I get to knock off. I love it. It's like your own personal catalog of fun things to do that appeal to you specifically, right? Yes. Because it's true. We don't always... How many people listening have had a moment where you finish all your work for the day, you did the things that were on your list and you kind of sit for a moment thinking, I know I have a million things I want to do that I could use this time for, but I'm still, my mind's still in fifth gear from all of the work I just did. I'm kind of not remembering, but if you have this wish list, I love even using it 
earlier in life, not just for retirement, but even if you have a, a weekend off or you want to take a vacation, wouldn't it be great to just have this ready list of things that popped in your head at some point and sounded amazing and you just want to keep track of them. So I love that advice that you give is to, to start keeping a wish list. Thank you. There's another thing, two things that kind of jump at me. I'm amazed at how popular pickleball is. I, I had never heard of pickleball until about five years ago. And I would say about one out of every three people that sees me talks about pickleball. It's it's kind of incredible. I find that very fascinating. And so I finally had to go explore it and see what it was all about and, and played it once. And and uh, it's it's very interesting. That's kind of taken the storm of, I don't know, whatever they used to do, golf and bowling or whatever. I find pickleball has kind of moved ahead of some of those. The other thing I did that I noted a long time ago is I look for people that I consider to be retirement mentors, people who I thought really had their act together, had figured it out, and I would ask them questions about retirement because I knew this is a, a difficult time frame for some people, yet these people seem to have their act together and seem to have a clue. So I would sit down and interview them and ask them, okay, how did you get to this point? What happens? How are you spending your time, your days? What are you actually doing? Because you seem to be so much happier than the average tired person. And then they would tell me their secrets, which weren't secrets at all, but common sense, but so valuable and, and so helpful. And you really need to have these conversations. You know, I've often heard retirement planning described as you begin with the end in mind, right? Like a Stephen Covey, because you really have to decide what your life is going to look like in the future so you can create the map to get there. What's your own personal view on how you set that map up? Because you you help people with that end goal and you, you help them flesh that out. But then it's time for nuts and bolts and you've got to help navigate the path to get there. Oh, absolutely. So I, I have an exercise. The subtitle of the book is The Three Ps That Will Keep You Young. And the three Ps are very simply purpose, passion, and a plan. So purpose is all the stuff you do for other people. Passion's what you do for yourself. And the plan is you need to have a plan. And what I find is some people have purpose. They might have passion. Almost no one has a plan. So I really try and encourage the fact that sit down and really map out your days. And I ask them to do three things a day. And I said, I don't care if one thing is taking out the mail or paying your bills or walking down to the grocery. I don't care what it is. I just want it on your list so that when the day's over, you can look and say, hey, I accomplished these three things today. It could be meeting someone for coffee or lunch or meeting. I don't care what you're doing. It's just almost not important. It's the fact that you're doing something and tracking it and appreciating the fact that you've done something cool for yourself. And then there's that big question of how much in finances, you know, stored away, saved, invested, does somebody need these days in order to live a comfortable life in retirement? And that's the big ticket question. A lot of people are head in the sand about it too. Uh, let me tell you, a lot of people don't actually want to know the answer because they feel maybe they're behind or they're not there. And knowing the answer is going to cause a lot of stress and concern, but it's something it's kind of like getting your teeth cleaned, right? It's something that's not necessarily fun to do, but you really have to in order to, um, to have a, a healthy financial outlook. So approximately in the United States, maybe even by region, I'm sure that the number varies quite a bit depending on where you want to live and what kind of lifestyle you want to have. But how much in, in assets does someone need to have at the age of retirement in order to kind of make it, especially because the government assistance type programs in retirement it's not quite what it used to be. It's not something you can count on the way you might have done ago. Oh, I, I agree with you completely. And it's funny that the answer to that question, it's all over the board. I, I mean, I have people that are extremely wealthy that can't live on 250000 a year. And they can't. They, they just cannot control themselves and their spending. I have people who are living on 80000 a year and doing great. And they have no stress. The two people at 250 had way more stress than the 80000 the eighty thousand dollar people had no bills. They had paid off their house. They're okay for money. They've got enough cash in the bank that they're comfortable. They're not rich, but they live a nice life, and there's no stress. The two fifty people, ironically, and I just had a meeting with them the other day, and I, it just amazes me. They've made all this money all these years, and they have almost nothing saved up. Actually, it's funny. The people with eighty have almost exactly what the people that are making two fifty a year, and they've been doing it for years. I always am floored at when I see those kind of things happen. But really, it comes down to having a budget. 
And what I ask my clients to do is I said, please put a budget together. I want to know what you spend in a month. And I said, if you'll do this, you'll learn a lot. And then we'll know what we're really playing with here. I said, I want you to write down every dollar you spend in a, in a given week. And then I want to see what that looks like for four weeks. And let's add it up. And let's see where your money went. Uh, fascinating results. <laughs> I have one person who was spending probably close to $80 a week at Starbucks. Nothing wrong with Starbucks. I like them. But 80 bucks a week on her income was a lot at Starbucks. But she was going every day more than once. And that's what she was dropping money. So that $80, if you start thinking about that per week, that's a lot of money per year. And going into retirement, I suggested she buy a really nice coffee machine. It'll pay for itself in two years. So you just look at things and you say, okay, budgets, let's figure out what you're spending. Then let's figure out what you're actually bringing in. And let's make sure that the numbers work. And if they don't work, you need to get some sort of part-time job, something that will be good for you, that you enjoy doing, and that will pay you. And that's fine. The big issue is when people don't do that, and then they start chasing money they can't afford to lose and making terrible investments. And that's a bad, that's a bad train wreck. Do you see any differences between the generations, right? We've got the boomers, Gen X, the millennials, and so on. Well, obviously, you've been in this business a while. So you you got to work with boomers when they were in the 40 to 45. You're working with Gen X when they're now in their 40, you know, to 45. And the millennials are just getting there. So do you think that there's actually a difference generationally in looking at retirement and how to plan for it? Oh, absolutely. I think, i be honest with you, I think the boomers have done a better job for retiring planning than the other two. The millennials are, I'm not sure about them yet. We'll see. But what I find is the generations differ. Some are not afraid of debt. And what I find most of my boomers are very debt conscious and they want to make sure they're okay. As we slide into the other generations, not quite so much. And that concerns me because ultimately that determines how successful your retirement's going to be. If you've run up lots of credit cards and all these big mortgages and big car payments, all of a sudden that makes retirement a whole different game. And I think the closer they get to that retirement number, they're going to have to really deal with those issues and see where they want to be and who they really want to be. And for anyone listening right now, whichever generation they're a part of, do you have something that's kind of that low hanging fruit, like some some advice that you find yourself giving to almost everybody you come across. It could even be kind of cocktail party conversation stuff where it's something that you know that's great advice, but that very few people out there in lay people who aren't in the financial world don't seem to really know. And it's just some great advice that you can throw out there to our audience today. Yeah, I I, I run I run with lots of different crowds, but one time I was sitting in a group of people and they were discussing credit card debt which I thought was really interesting in public. I mean, I, that's not anybody, but there they were talking, maybe they had a little too much alcohol. I don't know. Old fashions, I like those. So maybe they had a few of those too. But as they were talking about, I'm listening and I'm thinking all of these people have credit card. And so they're comparing the interest rate on their credit cards. And they were, you know, 50,000, 70,000, 20,000. I was just amazed. Well, one of them after that little get together came to see me in my office and said, listen, I, I know you didn't say anything that night, but you were listening and I want to know what you think. And I said, well, I can tell you exactly. I said, which one of those people were you? He said, well, I got about 30 grand on credit cards. I said, good. He said, I don't know how to get rid of it. I don't have the, I said, well, I have a rule for you. I said, I want you to get rid of every credit card you have, except the one you use the most. I said, get rid of the other ones. I said, next, I don't want you to use that credit card. I want you to pay cash for everything you buy this week. I never want you to pull that credit card out once. He said, well, I don't know how much cash that'll be. I said, well, let's find out and let's see what you're spending on. The interesting thing was that by Wednesday afternoon, he was out of money. So he had really not any clue what he was really spending and why he was having trouble. Once that became aware of, then he became aware of it and I became aware of it. We really sat down and designed a budget. So my solution is pay cash. I know cash isn't around anymore. It's not popular. People want their airline miles, all that stuff. But the reality of it is you want to get a grip on your finances. Just go out sometime and see how far your cash goes and when you run out. And then you can have a better sense of what's really happening in your life. There's some apps out there. I'll give you an example of one. It's published by a company called Intuit. They also make QuickBooks. The uh, the app is called Mint, M-I-N-T, like, like a mint leaf or like the mint, the prince money, right? Uh, Mint.com. 
And there's some other apps as well for just personal finance tracking. Do you think that sometimes awareness and sort of visibility into your own spending habits would be a good first step for people? Absolutely. Yeah, you just gave them one of the best things that's come out of this interview today. Absolutely. Because it's true. I think a lot of people are sort of blind to what they spend and even what they have saved. And I I work in the real estate world and a lot of times when a lender puts someone through that exercise of, okay, you're self-employed, great, draw up a profit and loss. You know, let me see what you're bringing in and what you're spending in that in that business that you own. Maybe you're a freelancer. And I've had clients who it's kind of a deer in the headlights moment when they have to put on paper what they're making, what they're spending and sort of what they're left with every month. And uh, so there is sort of a lack of awareness, even among entrepreneurs, even among business people who you think would have their finances kind of you know, high visibility. It, not always so, not always the case in my in my experience. I would agree with you 100%. I've had some very successful entrepreneurs be total train wrecks when it comes to their own finances. That They don't have any idea what they spend, what they're doing. They just spend it and, and then reality hits and they say, wow, I had no idea. Well, Gary, tell us where can people find your book? How do they connect with you to get in touch with you, either about your financial planning services or even just the teaching that you do in general? Okay. Amazon, of course, because you, you, everybody's on that. So we're on Amazon, How to Retire and Not Die. And then also GarySurak.com is my easiest way to get a hold of me. And one thing is if you do buy my book through my website with Christmas and everything like that coming up, I will personally sign it and make sure it gets to you in time. And uh, and so we've we've tried to do that. And that's been fun because all these people seem to know people about to retire. And it's a pretty good gift to give them if you can give them something that'll help for the next 30 years. What a great retirement gift for sure. Or anybody coming you know, near retirement or even if they're having one of the big birthdays, right? Like the 45, the 50, the 55, usually <laughs> the ones that end in a five or a zero or the big birthdays. And I love the title of the book again. It's How to Retire and Not Die. Great title. I, I think this is one of the few purchases that I would encourage people, hey, pull out your credit card for this one. This one's worth it. Don't even, you don't have to pay cash for this one. Use the credit card, get it in your library, get it on your bedside table so you can read through it and just have a better sort of outlook on what is retirement? You know, How do you plan for it? It's not just about the dollars. It's also about the lifestyle in a really big way. And if you're someone who doesn't focus on your lifestyle today, it's going to be really hard for you to focus on it later. Because I think uh, creating this great life with self-care and hobbies and family and fun and travel and finding things you enjoy to do, I think that's something that takes practice. It's not necessarily something you can just do out the gate. And uh, I definitely don't think it's something you can just learn at the age of 65 or 70 or, uh, you know, whatever your age is when you retire. So I highly encourage you all to reach out, uh, get a copy of the book, connect with Gary, great guy. And thank you so much, Gary, for all that you have shared with us today. It's been very educational and motivating. Thank you very much for having me as a guest. And it's been a pleasure and uh, always have fun when I get to talk to people about something that I really am passionate about. Guess what, lifestyle solopreneurs? If you don't yet have an online business earning you enough passive income to live the life of your dreams, I'd like to suggest you consider trying out Kajabi. Kajabi is an all-in-one solution where you can create and teach online courses, publish a paid newsletter, launch a free or paid podcast, process payments, build one-on-one -on -one coaching portals for your clients, and much, much more. I personally use Kajabi to power numerous successful and profitable online businesses. Lifestyle solopreneurs, there's a free trial of Kajabi waiting for you at this link, www.kfreetrial.com. You can try Kajabi for free, no obligation, by going to www.kfreetrial.com. Again, kfreetrial.com, and that K stands for Kajabi. Starting an online business helped me break free from that corporate grind, and I hope it does the same for you. You have nothing to lose and absolutely everything to gain. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and see you next time.